finish on, on your undergraduate uh, period. Were there any friends from that undergraduate um, era that you still keep in touch with or have influenced you a lot? Yes, I think um, there probably were. Um, most of them, well, I have some archaeologist friends um, I keep up with. Uh, mm. Barry Cundiff and I were mm. in the same year, well, and so yeah. we've mm. uh, uh, kept in contact. And mm. well, we've never been hugely close, but mm. we've been on lots of committees together. And uh, you succeeded uh, him, didn't you? And, uh, in, in in Southampton, mm. that's mm. right. And uh, we've edited some books together, and we've always sort of been very. Uh, constructive uh, in many ways. Charles Hyam was in the same oh. year and uh, now a professor in New Zealand and so I've kept track of him. But um, uh, most of my friends uh, really I made in the Union Society, uh, the, the debating society as you know, where uh, I really got uh, involved at an early stage and found it uh, the greatest fun mm. uh, and uh, so uh, I made a number of good friends, one Tony Firth who sadly died some years ago, uh, but many of them have went on to do great political things like Leon Britton who's still a very close friend who obviously became Home Secretary and so on, and then a, a whole series of other uh, active political people like uh, Michael Howard, Norman Lamont, John Gummer, Norman Fowler, all these, uh, if anybody knows about uh, conservative history of the uh, 70s, 80s and 90s, uh, they've all been very active people. You, you knew them all at the Union? That's right, yes. Mm. I got to know them all quite closely then. They were all really good friends then. Mm. And we've kept up uh, in various ways since we've often got together for... Um, dinner parties or that, that sort of thing. Um, and it was, um, it was Leon, actually. Uh, he was at that time seeking uh, a seat as, a, as an MP, as they all were. Ken Clark, I should have mentioned as well, who was one of the first to, to get a seat. And it was uh, Leon um, whom I invited to a feast in St. John's when I was a research fellow there. Uh, after doing my uh, doctoral dissertation um, and I was then at uh, uh, Sheffield University and uh, uh, a very safe Labour seat uh, there, Sheffield Brightside, uh, came up for a by-election mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Leon said to me, why don't you put your name in for that and it really hadn't occurred to me to do so and so I went back, I thought about it, went back the next day and thought why not, there wasn't, a, um, uh, it would need a very big uh, swing to get me uh, elected, so it wasn't changing my whole career at a mm. stroke, though mm. it offered the conceivable possibility of doing so. So I put in, uh, wrote to the chairman of the uh, constituency association and had a phone call more or less the following day saying, because uh, I was rather late in uh, applying, saying they were having the first uh, speeches of those who had put their names forward and would I go down and uh, uh, speak. Uh, so I uh, did so and that went quite well and would I come the next week there would be just a short list of two and I spoke again and then I was uh, chosen to be the candidate in this by-election um, and uh, that was a great uh, experience but that um, uh, put me more thoroughly into conservative politics than I had been. I'd been um, in the conservative group, CUCA, Cambridge University mm. uh, uh, Conservative Association while here, uh, and um, uh, so that really got me back into uh, politics. And uh, no doubt that's why many years later um, uh, somebody thought that if they wanted a few more working peers on the mm. conservative side, this of course much more recently in 1991 when I was uh, already at Jesus College, Master of Jesus, probably my name cropped up and they said, okay, we'll have him. Well, we'll come back back to that. Just yes. on, on the union, did, uh, how high up the hierarchy did you rise in the union? Oh, I became president, oh, yes. Well, that's what I was... Union elections were a very competitive uh, uh, enterprise mm. um, and so uh, one's paper speech uh, mm. for the term was always uh, important uh, and partly it's amusing because it is competitive, certainly quite light-hearted, mm. but also speeches on really interesting subjects. Mm. Um, 
I, I think the, the union was in many ways the most entertaining thing I did in Cambridge, and these friends I'm mentioning, uh, I'm sure, uh, feel the same way. Uh, and uh, for them, who became uh, very uh, adept politicians, it was an ideal training. Mm. And did, did uh, interesting people come down and speak who you met? Yes, oh, a whole series of, uh, of uh, people. I, um, in my term, uh, I had some interesting uh, debates, um, and uh, one of the best uh, was um, on the theme uh, where uh, science advances, religion recedes, <laughs> and that was proposed by Fred Hoyle, who of course sort of crashed about in a very atheistic way and was responded to in a much more subtle way by Joseph Needham. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, he, uh, you, you wouldn't necessarily think of uh, uh, Joseph Needham as a champion of religion, although perhaps when attacked you might, but I remember him very clearly saying and rather uh, charming us all by saying he never felt the sense of the numinous more profoundly than in Taoist temples in China, and we all <laughs> admired his deep experiences. And then my presidential debate uh, was, uh, uh, the highlight was uh, to have Lord Reith speaking. And Lord Reith, uh, as uh, you and an older generation will remember, uh, was a sort of legendary, monumental figure, as essentially the founder of the BBC, uh, and by that time, a lot of people thought he was dead. The Reith Lectures had already been established mm. for many years after he'd uh, retired from the BBC. Um, but uh, I'd come to know that he was uh, active uh, and invited him to speak, and he was uh, uh, terrific. Mm. Fascinating. Were you a member of any other societies? Um, yes, uh, quite a lot. As, as um, I was a member of the Conservative Association, uh, but um, uh, I joined the History and Philosophy of Science Society, and he gave a, a talk there, and um, then uh, the Fine Arts Society, mm. and certainly the Physics Society, and... No well, secret societies. Uh, no secret societies, no, uh, one, uh, except, one except that um, David Frost uh, and I, one or two friends, formed a dining club called the Cabal, <laughs> which was by invitation only, and we had very elaborate dinners once a term in the Garden House uh, Hotel, but it wasn't a secret, it certainly wasn't uh, either the Pitt Club or the Bullingdon Club. Or the Athenaeum. Um, uh, not the Athenaeum, the um, Apostles. Or anything no, like. no, no. I've had one or two apostles have come out on my interviews. Oh really? They've come clean, have yes, they? Yes, they, they talk about it now. <laughs> I tell them there are ten books with their names in it, so it's too late. <laughs> uh, Quentin Skinner, I think. Was oh, was name. he? I mm. didn't know that. Mm. Um, let, let's move on to your research, your PhD. Who, who was your supervisor for that? Frank Stubbings. Mm. Uh, and Frank was the lecturer in uh, pre-Hellenic mm. archaeology, and I been on excavations in Greece at the site of Nea Nicomedia and uh, enjoyed that very much. And uh, in my last year as an undergraduate I was looking around for a, a dissertation topic. Um, and I'd seen in the National Museum in Athens a very impressive gallery of the early Cycladic culture about which really rather little was known and nothing much had been written for the past 30 or 40 years and it seemed a sitting duck and also lots of connections had been proposed between that and different parts of Europe that seemed rather sort of um, challenging. Uh, and so uh, I thought that might be a good subject and I wrote aloud to uh, uh, several people, just not all of whom very politely replied. These are people I didn't know very well, if at all. People like John Evans, who was the professor uh, of European prehistory um, in London, and uh, one or two others, and they wrote back saying yes, they thought this was a good subject. Um, so that was the subject I chose. Hmm. And it worked well? It did. Um, first of all, it was an under-researched field, hmm. uh, and secondly, and this really wasn't why I chose it, but it involved travelling in the Cycladic Islands, <laughs> which are very beautiful in themselves, uh, but they weren't much frequented by foreigners then, and so to travel in rural Greece anywhere is a pleasure, and in the Cyclades a great pleasure. So I got to know quite a lot of people, I began to learn some uh, 
uh, some modern Greek and really um, had some very good times there. Um, and then the art college was very rich. I did a sort of site survey, not um, in the modern sense of walking up and down uh, strips, but just going to places that might be interesting or were known to be interesting, and so found quite a lot of things. So it was very uh, easy uh, to put together a new culture sequence and try and do it more systematically than had been done before. And then uh, the stories about the links with um, uh, the Balkans or the links with Iberia. I had by then uh, been to the Balkans. I'd done a research trip in the Balkans at the end of my last year as an undergraduate with some friends. So I knew some of the great sites like Karanovo in Bulgaria. And earlier with my parents, I'd been on holidays to Iberia and uh, they were very patient and if I wanted to go and see some megalithic tombs or something, inspired mainly by Glynn, um, then uh, so I had been to Malta, so I knew quite a lot of the background, and it was therefore quite easy for me to see that the proposed links with the Cyclades didn't really add up to very much. If you really knew the Cycladic material well, which I had come to do, then the points of comparison were not really very close. So it was easy to uh, write a broader uh, conclusion questioning these supposed links. Mm seems to be, that, that, how does that fit into your later work? Because a lot of that is showing links and, and wide connections, and this is restrict, seems to be restricting connections in some way. Well, you're, you're right, but in fact, um, it led in very well as a preparation because that was just the time that uh, radiocarbon dating was coming into operation. And of course, been <coughs> invented earlier, the first dates in 1949, uh, but it was only now that patterns of dates were coming through. Uh, and the radiocarbon dates um, in the Balkans or in Iberia or indeed in Britain were coming out much earlier than they ought to have done um, if the traditional chronologies, which Child mainly had set up, uh, were right. And the sort of links Child was using were links between the Cyclades and uh, Troy and the Balkans, or the Cyclades and uh, Iberia. Not that he particularly stressed the Cyclades, but these were the sort of links that he'd used <coughs> to build up the chronology of Europe. And uh, I was coming to see that some of those links didn't really make very good sense, and said so uh, clearly in, in that dissertation in 1965. <coughs> but then when the calibration of radiocarbon dating came in, the tree ring calibration, which allow, allowed radiocarbon dates to be re-evaluated. Uh, at that time, the, the, the dates were set much earlier, so this exacerbated the dislocation. And I could see not only that the radiocarbon dates made sense, but I could see clearly that the old links, many of them weren't worth very much. And so um, I pointed that out. That was what I called the second radiocarbon revolution. Hmm. And so that was my first, um, my, my first proper book uh, was mm. the Radiocarbon Revolution. Mm. And then after that, it was possible to start, start establishing new links, but on a different basis, using a different, uh, a different chronology. Um, radiocarbon I mean, features in, in many descriptions of your work as one of your main interests and <coughs> one of your main contributions. And why is it so important, the radiocarbon? technology or techniques? It is crucially uh, important um, because until radiocarbon dating became available and then became uh, improved through the calibration and through other technical advances, um, it was very difficult to date prehistoric cultures. Ultimately, the earliest reliable dates you have anywhere from historical means are back to around 3000 BC using the Egyptian historical chronology. So you can't really date anything older than that unless you have some method, some broadly scientific uh, method. And radiocarbon dating is by far the most useful. And of course it takes you much earlier, back to about 30 or 40,000 years ago. Before that you've got to rely on other radiometric methods like potassium argon dating which have become available. 
so that uh, really when radiocarbon dating came in, it allowed for the first time uh, the possibility of establishing chronologies of different things in different parts of the world. For instance, in the Americas, where the historical chronologies, also they weren't very well understood. There was a Maya chronology, but it wasn't very well understood until after radiocarbon dating was, uh, was applied. So that it was really radiocarbon dating that made possible uh, a book like Graham Clark's World Prehistory. It wasn't possible to have a coherent world prehistory until radiocarbon uh, was established. So uh, I think it was in many ways a turning point in uh, archaeology because until that time uh, much of the energy of archaeologists had to go into establishing chronologies which is often a thankless and difficult task. Then when radiocarbon came in, it, it still needs care, there are still points to argue about, but that solved the problem and that meant that archaeologists could now talk about something else as their primary interest other than just when was it and what the dating was. And so that was terrifically uh, important. And though <coughs> my own work, of course, I'm not a, a radiocarbon specialist, I don't do radiocarbon dates, uh, but I did see, so far as Europe is concerned, how the old system didn't work and how the radiocarbon dates could easily be made sense. To start with, there was a lot of argument and there was a very distinguished scholar working in Germany, Vladimir Miloicic, who said the whole radiocarbon system doesn't work, it's leading to confusion and so on. Uh, and uh, that was because he was following the logic of the old chronology, the chronology that Child had helped to establish, which did have its logic, but in some places it just was plain wrong. It was making the wrong assumptions, like some of those links. So I was fortunate, I was a little bit pre-adapted, having studied some of these uh, links in a slightly traditional way, when the radiocarbon dates then came in subsequently, I could see how the radiocarbon dates were to be believed, really, the revised radiocarbon dates, and how they made sense. Uh, and uh, so I could see that a new chronology was needed, and also a new approach to culture change, because that was what led on. Uh, uh, if the old chronology, which uh, implied diffusion, cultural diffusion from the Near East, the automatic diffusion of culture to sort of uh, uh, less enlightened lands in the north and west. Uh, um, the bar barbarism, uh, it was really the transformation, child saw it, uh, of barbarism to civilization through uh, a process of diffusion. That no longer worked. So one had really um, still rather amazing questions. When you look at some of the stone monuments, the so-called megalithic monuments of northwestern Europe, um, it seemed to beg a belief back in the, uh, uh, in the late 60s uh, or early 70s um, that those could be earlier than the pyramids. Um, and yet they are, and uh, that style of architecture got going long before anything comparable did in Egypt. And so not only is that surprising if you previously thought otherwise, but then it does offer you the problem okay, well, what led people to do these things? What got them to be so clever, if clever they were, in doing that? So it does uh, require a new, uh, a new mode of thinking, and uh, it does indeed uh, require um, new ideas or fresh ideas about innovation. I mean, the same applies to metallurgy, whereas it was assumed that uh, metallurgy diffused to Europe from the great halves of cultural progress in Sumer and Egypt. And then when it turned out that you had a really uh, quite intense copper metallurgy in the Balkans in the 5th and 4th millennia BC, before you had really very much to talk of elsewhere, or at any rate so it seemed <clears throat> in the 60s and 70s, then one had to say, OK, how did metallurgy uh, begin? And so uh, it really opened up important questions as how do innovations arrive and uh, what makes for progress, if that's the word you want to use, uh, in, in these areas. And indeed my own uh, work um, in the Cyclades, um, uh, the dissertation wasn't uh, published, but it was John Coles who uh, invited me um, some years later. He was doing a series with Matthew, the publisher, he asked me to do 
uh, a volume. And by this time, it wasn't going to be so much about the Cyclades, but about the emergence of civilization in the Aegean. And I called it the emergence of civilization. And the main theme, really, was that this is to be interpreted in Aegean terms, not as something that was diffused from the Near East. It wasn't so much just a chronological question as uh, a broader question. And so uh, a lot of those issues were all, uh, all arose uh, from or in relation to the radiocarbon revolution. Because if you've had that revolution, you really are looking for a new set of explanations. And uh, so um, explanation was really the name of the game. Lots of questions come out of that. One is, uh, you must have come up against the diffusionists. Uh, I see at one point I had some contact with the new diffusionist magazine and the new diffusionists, or the new... I, I think, were you one of their enemies? Yes, one of their arch enemies. Yeah. Although I managed to stay on um, really fairly civil terms. Mm. Uh, I subscribed to the new diffusionist and read to its pages with... Uh, still have one of the few scholars, I imagine, to have a complete series on my shelf somewhere of the new diffusionist. Um, and as you know very well, uh, that was hyper-diffusionism mm. of the old kind, mm. uh, meaning uh, really following the ideas of Elliot Smith that just about everything that happened started in Egypt or possibly in Sumer mm. and diffused out to the rest of the world so that if you have pyramids in Mesoamerica, they must be mm. derived from the pyramids of Egypt uh, and so on. Uh, and they were really distinctly hyper, uh, mm. uh, I think. Um, my own... Um, scholarship, if that's the word, um, in anti-diffusion and uh, diffusionism was more restricted uh, to what happened in Europe uh, and um, it was possible, as I'm saying, to show that the diffusionist explanations did not work there and then begin to suggest other explanations. Uh, but the new diffusionist magazine and its exponents uh, were certainly not content to speak only of Europe but definitely uh, took a pan-global vision, as you will remember. I knew. Um, it, how is this all related to what uh, is described as the Renfrew hypothesis, the, the uh, view that um, a, these a centre, we won't say the centre, a centre was a, in Anatolia? Um, in a way, it's almost the uh, the converse, um, uh, because um, in terms of um, uh, culture change, uh, as we've just been saying, I've uh, argued against any one preponderant centre, uh, but that we have to look at, uh, uh, at um, culture change in local terms and local interactions. Um, I developed the concept of peer polity interaction, uh, suggesting that if we look at in a particular area like the Aegean, and you have lots of local centres interacting and competing, out of that you can get quite a dynamic of culture change without having to look to some external uh, origin beyond that. Uh, so that's a slightly um, uh, different point from the, uh, the Indo-European issue, because when you refer to the so-called I didn't call it the Renfrew hypothesis. I think that's too narrow. Wiki, Wikipedia yeah. calls it that. That's, I think, because um, I've formed the view that I may be in error, that my Wikipedia entry, which I've never uh, tried to correct, I think it was written by Jim Mallory, uh, <laughs> who is uh, an enthusiastic Indo-Europeanist. And uh, the clue that gives it away is when you get to the bottom of the page, links, uh, there are one or two uh, links, for instance, to college in Cambridge or indeed to the Union Society, but there's also a link to Jim Mallory, uh, <laughs> and I certainly didn't put that there, and uh, so I wonder who did. It seems to me he possibly did. Um, and because he's uh, devoted much of his career to the Indo-European question, um, it's naturally at the forefront of his mind. But it, it came uh, to me, I'd always been sceptical, I'd read Childs, the Aryans, um, uh, uh, in that interesting reading uh, summer I had, uh, just before I changed to, it must be the summer of 1960, I suppose, when I changed to uh, archaeology. Uh, and uh, uh, Childs the Aryans was a book about the Indo-European languages. Um, and I didn't really find it very persuasive at all. And then uh, he, uh, one of his last books in 1949, 
uh, with prehistoric migrations in Europe. And uh, uh, that I found in very migrationist and diffusionist mode and didn't really uh, think that made very good sense. Um, so when I came to study uh, the prehistory of the Aegean, I kept on stubbing my toe against the circumstance that the Greeks, of course, speak and spoke an Indo-European language within the Indo-European language family, uh, but it was generally understood there must have been a coming of the Greeks, and the advent of the Greeks, the coming of the Greeks, was a big event to be variously dated by various scholars, but I could never really understand uh, the archaeological evidence for any major transformation at that time. But it was, of course, part of a wider story, which was the coming of the Indo-Europeans to Europe. Um, and when you looked into it, uh, there is this family of languages called Indo-European, and the linguists make a very plausible case that they're uh, related, which very few people would doubt. Um, and um, they must probably have started somewhere, though there are different models for linguistic origins. And so where would they start from? Well, there was this um, pre-existing idea which Child had promoted, that they all were great migrating warriors uh, from north of the great steppe lands, north of the Black Sea, who came riding in uh, on their horses and transforming uh, Europe um, at different uh, times, but generally more or less at the uh, beginning of the Bronze Age. But none of this really worked out uh, on more recent uh, analysis. Horse riding is something that really seems quite recent in prehistory, maybe about 1000 or 1200 BC. Before that you get horses pulling chariots, but their first arrival um, in Greece was around 1600 BC. You see them in the shaft graves of Mycenae. Uh, and yet, uh, by uh, the time I was looking into the Aegean, we'd already had the decipherment of Minoan Linear B by uh, Ventris and Chadwick, um, and that established uh, that the language spoken by the Mycenaeans in the Late Bronze Age, around, um, uh, well, I suppose, 13, 1400 BC, uh, was Greek. Uh, so uh, the uh, business of horses and chariots just a little before that um, didn't seem to say much about the Greeks, certainly not about the Indo-Europeans. So I got very sceptical about this. And uh, then I did an excavation uh, on the island of Milos, at the site of Philokopi, where I had the good fortune to find a, a sanctuary, what seemed to be a religious site, though that itself has got theoretical problems. But anyway, in writing that up, um, it seemed to me logical to suggest that in the Aegean you have um, an evolution, if that's the word, a series of local transformations in religious beliefs as we infer them from the material record, from the iconography. But you could take right back to the uh, early farming period, the Neolithic period, and you have a series of small changes, and then you have the flourishing at the time of the uh, shrine, around 1200 BC, and then continuity from there, uh, despite the Dark Ages in between, to uh, early Greece, archaic Greece, in 8th, 7th, 6th centuries BC. So I um, lectured about that in Oxford, and Professor Christopher Hawkes, who was one of the great figures, of our, he, he uh, said, Oh, you can't say that, Professor Renfrew. What about Zeus? Zeus Pitar. Uh, and the Indo-Europeans, uh, and he was pointing out that Zeus, uh, Jupiter, Zeus Pitar, is an Indo-European concept. Uh, and uh, so the Greeks were Indo-European speaking and therefore were Indo-Europeans. Uh, and so this idea of a continuity from the Neolithic through couldn't hold water uh, because clearly the Greeks were Indo-Europeans and they must have come in at some time after the Neolithic. And that really sufficiently irritated me uh, <laughs> to feel that it required a systematic answer. And I had already much earlier suggested that in relation to the place names of the uh, Aegean, which were supposed to be pre-Hellenic, um, uh, I'd already suggested that uh, the time that Indo-European speech came to the Aegean, to Greece, might have been with the first farmers which is one time you do see a major influx of influence from Anatolia, maybe ultimately from the Near East, but from Anatolia, in the Aegean. 
So I decided to sit down and study this through. So I did uh, what for me was a lot of background uh, reading, tried to understand what was happening with all the different kind of tablets found at Burgajke, the Hittite uh, capital, Hittite and Attic and so on, and tried to put this out coherently and indeed uh, essentially uh, critique or demolish the idea of steppe nomads at the beginning of the early Bronze Age, around 3000 BC, bringing Indo-European speech to Europe. But if that wasn't acceptable, then I had to put something in its place. And the only big transformation in Europe as a whole that seemed to be on a sufficiently major scale was the coming of farming to Europe. So I just said, OK, let's imagine uh, that uh, the coming of farming to Europe brought proto-Indo-European speech to Europe, which seemed a much better proposal, although nothing to confirm it particularly. And if Indo-European speech came to Europe with the coming of farming, then it must have come, the proximate source must have been uh, Anatolia. And so that was the theory, that is the Renfrew hypothesis, as Jim Mallory, or whoever cares to call it in Wikipedia. Uh, and uh, so I tried to develop this idea uh, and it really turned out, I think, I think, to make very good sense. So I uh, wrote the book Archaeology and Language, uh, which was initially not very well received by most linguists, mainly because they said the time scale, it's too early to have the coming of Indo-European speech to Europe from Anatolia around 7000 BC is just much earlier than could possibly be. And we as linguists have some understanding of the timing of these things. It's just too early. And so, but I found that if you ask them what is the basis of this understanding, uh, they all, almost to a man or woman, uh, reject glottochronology, which was uh, uh, a rather mechanistic relationship that had been uh, suggested some years uh, before. Uh, but they say, oh, well, we think about, for instance, we have a sense of when the Afroasiatic language is dispersed. But then if you look into when the Afroasiatic language is dispersed and you ask those people, well, we have a sense of the timing, we compare it with when the Indo-European language <laughs> is dispersed. So there were terrific circularities. Um, and interestingly, more recently, uh, much more recently, just about three years ago, Gray and Atkinson uh, published a very interesting article in Nature, uh, and these are really uh, computer boffins and people who are interested in uh, evolutionary phenomena. They're not particularly linguists, but they used uh, existing linguistic data uh, and some very good, uh, I think, certainly some very interesting quantitative methods uh, to come up with uh, a date for the first split in the Indo-European language family, and they compared it deliberately. They put on their diagram the traditional view, as exemplified, for instance, by Maria Gimbertas, or indeed by Jim Mallory, uh, and uh, that was about sort of 3000 BC, and then the farming spread around 7000 BC, and just about all of their points, all of their data points, fell on the 7000 BC uh, uh, time frame. So, uh, uh, I think linguists are beginning to take a little notice uh, of that, uh, but there is so much scholarship surrounding, I mean, there's a whole field of uh, Indo-Germans, Indo-Germanistique, hmm. uh, as the Germans call it, and they're very fond of it. So they're really not very willing to move uh, away from that. Uh, but um, I've kept in touch with the subject. I haven't contributed very much to it, other than organising some conferences on time depth in language change, and one recently on phylogenetic methods in, uh, in language change. Uh, but um, anyway, that's the so-called Renfrew hypothesis, and though it certainly hasn't won the hearts of the majority of linguists, um, uh, I don't think there's any better hypothesis for the spread of uh, Indo-European in Europe, and certainly there are very few archaeologists who want to hear the hooves uh, of the nomad horses pounding in uh, in, uh, in 3000 BC when horse riding wasn't a phenomenon in Europe at all. Fascinating. Just to see if I've got it, the, the agricultural revolution occurs, the language changes, 
because of a change in the mode of production in a certain area, and then the language spreads from that area, or does it? Uh, it, it isn't quite that. If I move, it, it's that um, uh, the farming revolution takes uh, place may, probably at one or two locations that are in contact in the Near East. But anyway, the most westerly region involved. Uh, is southeast and central Anatolia. So uh, you get farming taking place there. And the point is that the farming uh, technology is inherently an expansive one. It's expansive for demographic reasons uh, that uh, a typical uh, hunter-gatherer population density in such an area, uh, not necessarily a maritime area, which is more complicated, is perhaps uh, one person per ten square kilometres, uh, whereas uh, uh, a straightforward farming economy in such an area, a dry farming economy, will easily support a population of ten persons per square kilometre. That's a change of a factor of a hundred, mm. uh, and uh, uh, that is uh, the reason that um, uh, I think farming economies often, not always, but often, are very expansive uh, economies, and there's no doubt that farming did spread um, uh, across Europe. Uh, Cavalli, Sforza and Ammermann formalized the uh, demographic ideas, called it a wave of advance, uh, and though that maybe a slight oversimplification. I think their ideas are interesting and the emphasis on the demography is sound. So what that means uh, is that um, whatever the language was of the, uh, uh, the economy that was now spreading because it had become a farming economy uh, was spread across Europe. And therefore, that's the only reason that leads me to situate Proto-Indo-European in central Anatolia because if you trace that... Uh, um, if you go back through time to where that movement uh, essentially originated, um, it must have been central Anatolia. Just, just finally, because I'm being very dense, it's the people spread rather than the, and carry the language. It's not that the people stay in the same place, but the technology is so much more efficient that other people in other areas pick up the technology well, with the language. Both, both need to be uh, considered very carefully and um, there is definitely one school of thought um, uh, relating to European prehistory that it was more the technology uh, that was spread through contact mm. and that the population growth occurred in the existing populations mm. that uh, acquired the new technology and so their, uh, uh, their population increased. But the beauty of the Ammon Cavalli Sforza model is that they showed uh, that if you have um, an exponential or indeed a logistic uh, growth uh, rate, um, then even if you have only quite small movements of individuals, for example of 10 or 15 kilometers, but if what is motivating and powering the demographic increase uh, is the acquisition of farming, uh, then what you do get is a wave of advance uh, that involves uh, individuals moving not much more than 10, 10 or 20 kilometers, uh, but that uh, uh, it is indeed, if you're thinking about the ancestry or indeed the genes uh, that are spreading, it is the genes uh, of those uh, who are initially speaking the language. Now, uh, uh, archaeogenetics has come into play uh, a great deal, and it really is rather more complicated than that. There is some evidence to suggest in the, in the male line, that seems to be the picture, uh, with the female line, with mitochondrial DNA, um, it's not clear at all. But um, I think you can have a, a slightly uh, more sophisticated model. If you uh, imagine uh, a group moving off, budding off, uh, going 20 kilometers towards the northwest, uh, and then that group who are speaking the Proto-Indo-European language, uh, they <coughs> admit two or three of the locals who are non-Indo-European speakers and also um, uh, have their own genes, which are not the genes of the first farmers. If those come into the group, uh, the way language works, it's so robust uh, that the language will be maintained as an entity even though you don't have one or hundred percent, you only got ninety percent uh, of the farming genes in that group. Then if you go on doing this several times over, the language is spreading, uh, 
being carried uh, across with the farming without very much change. But if it's 90% uh, this time, then it's going to be 0.81% ne next step, but then 0.7%. So that by the time you've gone 10 or 15 steps down the line, uh, the genes uh, are going to be largely the genes of where you are, of the, the people, the Mesolithic people who are not farmers, but the language is going to be maintained as a fairly robust entity. And I think that's roughly what happened, and I think some of the archaeogenetics is rather supporting that. Fascinating. Well, another six hours and we could get to the bottom of it, but, uh, or at least further down the tunnel. But let's come back to your personal life and, and your professional life outside, well, uh, alongside archaeology. One, one thing I'd like, of course, to talk about is uh, your quite early marriage to Jane. Yes, well, I was very fortunate um, in getting to know uh, Jane uh, in Cambridge. Mm. I was doing research. In fact, uh, it, it was a romance made in the Haddon Library, you'll be <laughs> glad to know. Hooray, uh, I'm sure they'll dramatise it one day. <laughs> I first met Jane in the Haddon Library when she was uh, then an undergraduate, and uh, I was by then, I think, in my final final year as, as, as an undergraduate. Uh, and... Um, so uh, uh, I invited her to accompany to the, to the May Ball uh, mm -hmm. that year in uh, St. John's, where I was a student, and she came, and so we became very good friends. Then I went off to research in Greece mainly, uh, and she came out uh, on the excavations. And she was um, uh, already in the excavations at uh, Nea Nicomedia, I may say, the, sec the second year <coughs> there, so I got to know her better then. Uh, and then she came out to visit me in the Cyclades, uh, and uh, I proposed to her uh, <laughs> on the island of Naxos. Uh, and then uh, by the final year of my first excavations on Saliagos, uh, which was while I was still a research student, um, we got married uh, that year. Uh, and uh, so that was uh, that early stage in our, uh, in our uh, association. Uh, and then, uh, of course, when we moved from uh, uh, Cambridge to Sheffield in 1965, we set up our sir, and then we began to have a family and so on. And Jane, of course, uh, uh, had her own uh, research, which she was conducting as a botanist. Uh, and uh, she, uh, partly under the influence of uh, Eric Higgs, uh, had taken up uh, uh, what she came to call in her book, Paleoethnobotany, that's to say the, the study of plant food remains uh, in prehistoric times. And she did very elegant dissertation looking at um, carbonized grain samples from Greece and the Balkans, which we were able to uh, collect on our travels, being given by museum curators and so on. And so uh, I think she found it quite hard work uh, as uh, um, a married woman to complete the dissertation, but she got it finished. Uh, and uh, so that continues to be her uh, line of country. And as you know, she's uh, now a fellow of Lucy Cavendish College. She was a lecturer in Sheffield, but then when I was invited to take the chair in Southampton, as so often happens uh, with married couples, uh, she didn't have a job in Southampton when we moved. And then our family got bigger, and uh, so she didn't really look for one. Uh, but she's maintained her academic career with her publications and her, her work in Lucy Cavendish College. She started her academic career very, very young. I mean, very, it's very unusual to find a 17, 18-year-old daughter of the Dean of Carlisle or whatever, I've got the details from memory, writing a very important, or editing an important diary, Antiquary, Antiquary on, on Horseback. Horseback. That's right. Well, that is a very nice story. She. She got very interested, uh, clearly, as a schoolgirl, uh, and her father was then, he became Dean of Carlisle later, uh, but he um, is and was a, a clergyman, and uh, I think encouraged her to study the Machel papers, mm. uh, which were curated in um, uh, the uh, uh, records mm. at, uh, at Carlisle, and uh, she, she knew the area well, and transcribed these, and edited the, uh, the papers, mm -hmm. and so it's a really rather charming uh, antiquarian uh, mm -hmm. book. Uh, and of course, Glynn 
Daniel, uh, who was uh, always, as I said, uh, like the, the, the personal view of, of things, he made a point of uh, quoting from her book in one of his classes in the history <laughs> of archaeology, and that's not often from a, a pupil present in the class or, or something like that. So she was a little embarrassed by that, but also rather uh, tickled. So you're right, see, she got off to a very um, uh, early start indeed with uh, a book that is, uh, remains a rather a distinguished mm. contribution to uh, the history of uh, antiquarian studies in England. Indeed, a, a classic. Um, Sheffield, you didn't become, you uh, didn't succeed in overturning the Labour majority, I presume? No, no. Uh, it was a big swing. Uh, uh, it was, um, I think, it was a, a safe Labour seat, or reckoned to be, of 19,000 majority, and we reduced the majority to about 5,000. And there really seemed to be moments when, uh, this was the Wilson years, when uh, um, we might win the seat. Uh, and uh, this led to a great deal of press and interest. So the by-election was really quite exciting, because whereas in a general election you very rarely have a reporter at all in any one seat other than in London, but all the journalists came and we had a press conference every day, and I thought this was going to be exceedingly difficult because I wasn't briefed on every channel, reasonably informed, but I wasn't a specialist. And all these journalists are, of course, because it's their life to know every in and out of... Uh, the, uh, uh, the the uh, political uh, platforms, uh, but uh, it all went very well. And they weren't setting out to be difficult, uh, they were just wanting a statement and so on. So that was really um, uh, an exciting experience, uh, which I thoroughly enjoyed, and it amazed me at the end uh, that I'd, of course, prepared for a little, then the campaign was three weeks, but the whole thing was sort of a, a six-week enterprise, which is much less time than it takes to write uh, uh, an archaeological paper, uh, which then is buried in the proceedings <laughs> of the Prehistoric Society or something, uh, and not read by a very large number of people. So uh, I thought it uh, very great fun, uh, and then I was after that, because it, the campaign had gone very well, it, it was suggested I should put in for one or two seats, um, which uh, one or two of which would have been safe seats, um, but it was clear to me that uh, if I were elected to a safe seat, then uh, I really wouldn't be able to continue with the archaeology. It was clear to, to me that uh, you couldn't do the politics on the side and you couldn't redo really the archaeology on the side. It might be difficult, different, uh, as one or two economists or historians have been, if you were a, um, a professor of political theory, uh, then you might be an MP successfully, but even that I think would be quite difficult. So uh, I decided not to follow up uh, the glittering prizes uh, of British politics, uh, but rather to stay in Sheffield University, which I was perfectly happy with. Uh, this is just a personal question, but did you, did you, my uncle was a Conservative MP for Cambridge for some years, uh, Robert Rose James. Did you come across him yes. at all? Yes. Well, I got to know him very well, and his wife, uh, mm, and uh, um, liked him very much. I didn't get to know him at that time, mm. uh, but when we moved here to um, Cambridge uh, in uh, 1981, uh, uh, then uh, we had friends in common. I think mm. our Conservative mm. friends mm. put us in touch and I thought he was a delightful person, and he was certainly uh, one of the MPs, definitely at the scholarly end mm. uh, of the parliamentary spectrum. He was also also at the wet end of the uh, parliamentary spectrum, and uh, he revealed his feelings about um, Margaret Thatcher occasionally, and, and ended by leaving the party. But um, if you had to place yourself along that rather spurious um, spectrum. Where, where would you, were you, I mean, he was very liberal and... and yes, um, I think I would uh, put myself in the same uh, area as he, uh, really. Um, I've known Michael Howard uh, over the years very well and debated lots of issues with him uh, and continue uh, to do so. Uh, and 
I think I can safely say I've always placed myself well to the left of Michael Howard. Um, uh, I was uh, um, having dinner with him just the other day, and uh, he was uh, assuring me how McCain was the right candidate in the American presidential election. And I'm not so, so sure of that. So, uh, I think Obama might be my vote, were I voting in the election. Uh, so, uh, yes, I've always been, as indeed have a lot of my friends, somebody like Ken Clark, I was going to say, yes. uh, um, I've often seen eye to eye with him, mm. uh, and uh, indeed I actually regret uh, that uh, the Conservative leadership didn't uh, pass him. on to him. Uh, I have great respect and liking for Michael Howard, but I have more affinity with Ken Clark's mm. policies, and uh, that was a, a disappointment, I think, and a loss to British mm. politics. I mean, it's still there, but he's, uh, mm. he's a, a very much a backbencher now. Mm. Well, leaping over along that line to um, your time in the Lords, how, uh, you, are you or were you a working, as they call it, a working peer? Yes, I was invited to be uh, a working peer. This was in 1991, I think, when I was um, uh, already been Master of St. John's for some time. Yeah, um, um, master of... A Master of Jesus, I beg your pardon. Thank you for the correct one. I'd already be Master of Jesus for some time. We'll have Robert Hound on our back. <laughs> <laughs> I think he might raise a, an eyebrow uh, on that. Um, and um, so I had this letter mm. saying, uh, would I consider being a, a working bid? Of course, very much honoured to receive such a, a letter from the Prime Minister, from Lord Major. Uh, and uh, so... I thought, thought, well, what does this mean, really? And I tried to find out what is expected of a working peer. So uh, I uh, asked uh, the chief uh, whip, uh, Richard Ryder, uh, wrote to him and said, what does it mean to be a working peer? Can you explain this to me? What would I have to do? And they said, we think you'd have to be uh, in Westminster two days a week. And at that time, um, I was Master of Jesus, and I was... Um, uh, head of the Department of Archaeology, I didn't really see how I could do uh, two days a week in Westminster. So um, I thought about it a lot and actually wrote a, a letter saying I, to the Prime Minister saying I was deeply uh, honoured, but I really felt uh, if that was what was required that I just uh, shouldn't take it on, couldn't do it properly. Uh, but then I had a phone call from Richard Ryder and indeed one from Ken Clark saying that uh, there'd been some discussion we think one day a week might <laughs> be enough. Uh, and I thought, yes, well, I believe I can do one day a week. Um, and because parliamentary business is only arranged um, uh, a week or ten days ahead of the present time, um, it was really necessary to uh, choose a day, which in parliamentary terms turned out to be Tuesday, so I started going, and generally since then have gone uh, at least uh, one day on a Tuesday. It's different if there's a three-line whip, then, uh, which happens really very rarely, le less often than once a year. Then you can drop everything and go and vote, uh, if that's the expectation. So um, that's what I did, and I found it a very interesting uh, experience. Obviously it was a Conservative government at the time, and just about the first legislation I got involved in was the Higher Education Bill, uh, when quite a few really rather silly things were being uh, proposed that were widely felt to be restrictive of academic freedom. Uh, and so um, I got involved to start with, uh, speaking quite often against the government rather than for the government on those specific issues. But that was very um, interesting, and uh, uh, the government did have to change its view on one or two important issues. Of course, there were a lot of people uh, criticising it, and a lot of crossbenchers in particular. And then, since then, I've kept involved in some uh, of the uh, higher education debates. Certainly, um, the last time, uh, forget, three or four years ago, when Tessa Blackstone was uh, passing through the Lords, uh, conducting through the Lords, um, the then Higher Education Bill, I thought that was a pretty poor bill, and I said so in relation to a number of amendments. I was actually rather disappointed uh, that there weren't uh, a few uh, Labour academic peers, because uh, several uh, who exist, 
they seem to be rather absent from the debates. Lord uh, Giddens was there? Uh, or? I think it was probably just before the time of Lord Giddens, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't remember Lord Eatwell making very substantial <laughs> contributions to those debates or giving a clear analysis of why things weren't working as well as they should have done. Uh, but um, a good deal of my uh, debating and so on uh, in the Lords has been uh, in relation to the illicit antiquities trade, which uh, I've rather taken against in recent years and been involved in trying to raise the profile of that problem. But it's fair to say that um, since, uh, since Labour came into power, there hasn't been the same pressure uh, to be taking part in all the votes on the Conservative side. If you're in government, uh, then you need all your peers to ensure that the governmental legislation gets through. Uh, if you're in opposition, uh, everybody can choose their issue more selectively. So I haven't spent as much time in the Lords in the past few years uh, as I did uh, in the first six or seven years from 1991. Were you involved at all in this recent 42 days detention debate? Yes, yes I was. Um, I didn't speak in the debate, um, partly because um, the convention in the Lords is everybody who wants to speak can speak. <clears throat> so a simple debate on a simple issue can go on for hours and hours and hours. But I did vote um, on the first time, on the, uh, I was there present for the second reading, and then I was there just ten days ago. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I wasn't planning to be. It wasn't actually a three-line whip, but I had a telephone call from the whip's office and I thought, yes, I really ought to go because I thought the 42 days was outrageous and it was a very good debate with, as you know, a lot of uh, uh, senior people in the security services mm. uh, and the former Attorney General, Lord Goldsmith, though he actually, I think, was overseas on the vote, but his views are known and Lord Falconer, somebody whom I don't have deep admiration for, uh, but at least uh, he stood out against the 42 days, even though at an earlier stage, with uh, different safeguards, as he uh, explained, with lesser safeguards, or with more safeguards maybe, um, he'd been in favour of the 90 days. Uh, <laughs> so that was a little paradoxical. But yes, I did uh, vote um, with the amendment and against the government there. And of course, that was one of the good examples I think of how the Lords can be quite mm. decisive because the vote had been carried in the Commons, of course, as you mm. know, after a lot of argy-bargy. Uh, but <clears throat> if it had gone back to the Commons, the government might have got, got it through again with a very strong three-line whip, but it would have given the Commons a chance to think about it again. Mm. And the government was obviously going to have great difficulty getting it through the Commons, so they just thought it simpler to call it a day uh, and so that was one of the cases where the will of the Lords could prevail over the will of the Commons, although really I think only because the will of the Commons, if tested a second or third time, might have been found wanting. So due to time constraints, we'll, we'll move over the time as Professor at Sheffield, then Professor at Southampton. I wasn't actually Professor in Sheffield, uh, I was lecturer. made reader and then uh, I was invited to go to Southampton, that's right. Yeah. Um, and then, um, sadly but swiftly move on to um, coming as Disney Professor to Cambridge in 1981. That's correct. And you bumped up straight against my professor, Jack Goody, and um, yes. um, I remember some stormy uh, faculty boards then. Yes, I'm not quite sure why we had um, what seemed to be a rather an agonistic relationship because Jack is a charming and interesting man. Um, I think he must have felt it his duty uh, in some way to maintain uh, a position. I remember um, there was some, I forget, some small problem uh, where what seemed to be some quibble was raised and I was mildly dismissive uh, of it uh, uh, and uh, didn't think it was a serious matter. And I remember the response, if that is your view, this is total war. <laughs> uh, and uh, up to a point within academic limits, it did seem to be total war. Of course, it was a product of the faculty system that everybody is competing for resources. And so the two big departments, archaeology and social anthropology, then biological anthropology uh, sort of doing its best, but rather in mm. third place at mm. that time. Uh, and so uh, it did seem to me, I've, I've, I've 
very fond of Jack now and get on with mm. him perfectly well. Uh, but there were a sort of occasional episodes of walking out and slamming mm. doors and so on that always seemed to me just a shade histrionic. Yes, I think it's always partly inherited too because they've been going on the, these battles with Grimm um, um, before, so it was just right. a traditional kind of war. It didn't seem terribly sort of cooperative atmosphere, although all the individuals were mm. charming and uh, uh, at that time I wasn't seeing much of uh, Jack, but he was charming mm. enough personally. Uh, mm. But it, it was a rather strange world to be in, really, the world of the faculty board. And I was chairing it, I remember. And you were chairing it with great <laughs> uh, aplomb, well, <laughs> but uh, it wouldn't be fair to say you were totally controlling it. <laughs> it wouldn't. Uh, and then uh, Ernest came. How did you get on with Ernest? Very well. Ernest I, knew, about it. I thought he was a great man, uh, and I wish uh, I'd... I mean, I did know him quite well, uh, but uh, uh, he had a seminar which uh, he uh, organised uh, at LSE, which I used to go to. Uh, sometimes, uh, with um, the name just got out of my mind. John Hall? Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, who was very bright, and uh, uh, I'd known him uh, in Southampton, mm -hmm. uh, indeed. Uh, and uh, Ernest was always interesting, uh, but had a, a capacity to be uh, acerbic, uh, which he didn't deploy often enough in my presence. <laughs> uh, and uh, I always enjoyed, just heard one or two set pieces. Uh, I remember one uh, lecture he gave, um, uh, it was in our South Lecture Room, so I'm not quite mm. sure who it was, who it was to, uh, but it was uh, on the theme of psychoanalysis, mm. uh, and uh, I thought it was a, a wonderful demolition, um, and a totally persuasive, and it wasn't demolishing everything of course, but a totally persuasive uh, demolition of some aspects of post-Freudian psychoanalysis, um, uh, which uh, said things and clarified things for me, and I wish I'd heard Ernest lecture more often. He did, of course, by invitation, lecture to archaeologists, and I invited him to things which he did. I thought he was terrific value, but I was just sorry that we, uh, uh, he invited me to dinner and so on, we, we were good friends, but I was sorry, really, that I didn't have more interaction with him uh, mm. here in Cambridge. Mm. That's true, of course, of the whole archaeology department, though I haven't really thought about it deeply, uh, but one of the missed opportunities, I think, of being in Cambridge, partly because we're all busy people, mm. so I've been invited off often enough to your mm. seminars uh, mm. and so on, and haven't often had time mm. to attend them, and uh, I think probably one of the um, deficiencies in our system has been that although we're uh, members of the same faculty, uh, and it isn't just because of political tensions, those were not really all that important, uh, I've not learned enough from uh, Cambridge Anthropology as I should have done. Mm -hmm. Well, it's mutual. <laughs> <laughs> it could be so. Um, well, there's many, much more to be said about the, your uh, place as a Disney professor, but perhaps one thing particularly you ought to touch on is the founding of the MacDonald Institute. Well, that was a wonderful piece of good fortune uh, uh, for me. When, when um, I became Master of Jesus, um, I became more and more, or earlier, I became more and more clear that the resources available to the Department of Archaeology were lamentable. We had hardly any laboratories. We had that miserable little 1948 extension that Eric Higgs had used to uh, work in. Um, we had very poor resources. We, had, we seemed to have a lively school of uh, PhD students, but nowhere for them to be. Uh, and uh, so um, uh, something that I thought strongly needed to happen was to take that space, because the 1948 extension, I think, was one floor and build it up into a suite of laboratories and indeed uh, I saw that there was the risk I might become uh, vice-chancellor because it went it was a two-year thing went circulating around the colleges um, as you'll remember uh, and uh, the system was changed uh, mercifully so that it became a longer tenure which made for better vice-chancellors, I think, but I might have been in line uh, uh, next along or next but one, um, had it not changed, uh, and I'd seen that something that really ought to, I ought to try and do 
for archaeology, if I was vice chancellor, to try and bring about that to happen. But then I had this contact from um, uh, somebody who said they were representing uh, a wealthy person who would like to visit the department. Um, they didn't mention who the wealthy person was. Uh, it was all very secretive, but it was clear that some good might come our way. So we organised um, uh, a visit to the department and a nice lunch in Jesus College. Um, and Dr. Mac, Dr. MacDonald, uh, rode up with his uh, uh, two advisers. And uh, he was um, uh, in his 80s, sort of rather brusque uh, Scotsman, and took keen interest in a lot of things, very swiftly went round, oh, very interesting, thank you very much, uh, and on to the next thing. And we got Paul Mellors and Joe Noakes and uh, Nicholas Postgate and a lot of interesting people in different fields in archaeology uh, to meet him at lunch. And they had a very good conversation after lunch. He was interested in early man questions with Paul Mellors. And then he said, hmm, very interesting, thank you very much. And away he went. Uh, so I thought, well, don't get much out of that. Uh, and then um, about a um, um, fortnight later, I got a letter from the same advisor saying, well, we enjoyed our visit. I wonder if I and my colleague, not Dr. Mac, I and my colleague could uh, call on you again. So I thought, well, we're not going to go through the lunch performance this time, so come and have a cup of coffee, which they did. Um, and then um, uh, they said uh, it's been decided uh, that Dr. MacDonald would like to give uh, your department £100,000 a year uh, for five years, would that be acceptable? Uh, so that was an easy question to answer. And then the next question was, how would you spend a, a larger sum? Now, that was clearly a good question, but I already had this concept in mind, and I said, uh, I could see that it might be a, a lot of money, so I said, well, really what we needed was an institute which would mean premises and building, mm. uh, which would allow us to do archaeology properly. And when I took that to the Secretary General of the Faculty, it was very uh, encouraging. I think they'd had a, mis un a misfortune uh, a couple of months previously when they'd lost some benefaction by not paying enough attention. So they jolly well did pay attention, but they pointed out if you get a building, you're going to have to get it endowed because the university is mm. not going to pay mm. to maintain your building. Uh, and so he was invited again and came, and it was getting near Christmas, the college choir came in and sang to him, and we did our best. And he then broadly decided that he would like to set up an institute, a McDonald Institute, and we got costings, the Secretary General had been really very good, we got... Was this Ken Edwards? Or? It was, yes, uh, and he did a terrific job in... Uh, um, he suggested we should get an architect in to do a draft design, which he, or his department, or his, uh, his office paid for, so that we really had something to show Dr. Mac, and he liked it, and the costing was it would cost about £5 million to do the building, uh, and uh, I suggested £5 million for the endowment. This was before the university was taking such heavy overheads as mm. it seems now to do. Um, and uh, so that was broadly agreed, and though there were some thrills and spills and anxieties along the way, and planning permission refused, uh, and then very sadly uh, Dr. Mac died before it all came about. Uh, but um, we'd agreed on what a building should look like, uh, and when the costings were done in detail, if really good materials are going to be used, it was going to cost six million, not five million, and he agreed to that, and so uh, that all happened. And though very sadly he died, uh, it was clear in his will, and it took a while to uh, arrange, but it, uh, it came about, and it has made a, a, a huge difference to the department, which now has decent base. And I'd suggested it should mainly be for graduate students, mainly because I thought we shouldn't be letting the university off the hook in what it should be doing to supply some facilities itself. Mm. Not that it's really done so, but uh, the concept of it being for postgraduate work, I think, still makes sense. Thank you. And uh, you're the director at the moment of... No, I was the director until, um, in fact, I was invited to write the statutes and I, was in, I ensured that the Disney professor was the director, <laughs> but I overlooked, and it, perhaps there's no harm, I didn't stipulate that the Disney professor, when he retired, should still be the director. <laughs> so the new Disney professor is the director, which indeed is... Your uh, researcher, uh, senior uh, senior uh, senior. Senior, Which indeed is perfectly uh, appropriate. Um, 
I, I think it's a shame in some universities that people are tipped out uh, mm. when they reach retirement age, but I think it's right that they uh, finish up uh, as uh, head of the top department. I think it's time for a new head of department or director. And I do have an office there for which I'm grateful, so I have no complaints at all. Mm. And uh, just finally, on, on Jesus itself, the college, um, uh, you were master for about 11 years, is That's that right? right? Yes. yes. Did you enjoy doing that? Very much. I thought it was, uh, um, it's a wonderful institution, a college, uh, and Jesus is not too big a college, so Jane and I were able to get to know a lot of the students, uh, and uh, uh, we really enjoyed student life, and uh, tried to take an interest. Uh, uh, we got very involved with the rowing, which I'd never done uh, as a, a student here myself, and with the music and with a lot of things, um, and uh, really found it a very intense uh, life uh, and uh, a very rewarding one. It obviously kept me back a bit from the archaeology, though I've tried to catch up with that uh, since, uh, but it was really very good fun. Had its difficulties, um, uh, there are always some fellows who don't totally agree with the master, uh, <laughs> and so uh, not everything went perfectly smoothly. Uh, but um, uh, with, there were no disasters, and uh, we had our quincentenary, so I had to lead the appeal where we built a, a new library, very beautiful library designed by Evans and Shalev, uh, and uh, all of that went uh, really uh, very well. and. Uh, so it was, it was an excellent decade for us. Mm, lovely. Well, I always feel that I must have missed quite a lot, but is there anything outstanding that, I, that I've missed that you would have liked to have said? Um, about? There are two things. Uh, one might be too long just for a tail end thing, which is sort of what I've been doing the past four or five years, getting mm. involved with material engagement theory, but that may be just a little bit uh, archaeological. But what we haven't spoken about at all is the art at Jesus College, mm. which uh, has been uh, very good fun and was mm. indeed part of that, although it continues. Mm. Oh, tell me something uh, about that. And uh, I've always been interested in uh, contemporary art. And when uh, when I was elected, um, we obviously moved from our house in Chaucer Road uh, into the Master's Lodge, which is a very handsome uh, building. Though we we kept we rented the Chaucer Road house, um, and so uh, we found ourselves with a lot of wall space. So I actually took out uh, an additional mortgage, not a huge one, but a small additional mortgage on our house to have some ready money, partly to move in, although we're moving into a building that's in principle furnished, there were quite a lot of things to do, but also to buy some uh, contemporary paintings. I bought, I already had a few, but I bought a very handsome uh, uh, painting by John Hoyland to go above the fireplace, uh, and uh, then got some handsome paintings by John McLean. But then, uh, the, the one or two fellows who were interested in uh, sculpture uh, and we agreed to have a, uh, a sculpture exhibition which we called Sculpture in the Close uh, and we invited some distinguished sculptors uh, uh, to take part, Richard Long, Barry Flanagan, Denise de Cordova, uh, one or two more and that was really quite a success so it happened again two years later and gradually the college has built up a whole group of uh, friends of the college who are really very distinguished sculptors. When we got our new library going, uh, the senior bursar, John Killen, suggested we should follow the 1% rule, which is to assign 1% of the cost of the building to works of art, or a work of art. And that allowed us to uh, do an important commission. And we'd had um, Anthony Gormley uh, in uh, one of our exhibitions the previous year with a beautiful work in the Fellows Garden. So we asked him to do a sculpture for the, uh, uh, the top of the stairs. And so we have a very handsome Gormley work, uh, Learning to See, uh, there. Uh, and then uh, Eduardo Paolozzi became a great friend of the college and gave us some wonderful things, gave us a wonderful set of... Uh, prints in the computer room, calcium light night, uh, and a couple of sculptures. And then Barry Flanagan had loaned us uh, uh, from uh, our first exhibition uh, a bronze horse, a life-size bronze horse, 
which is in the, uh, in the first court, um, and that's on long-term loan to the college. And then when the Queen came um, for the opening, Barry Flanagan was there uh, and uh, had a bit of an altercation uh, with uh, uh, the Chancellor, with Prince Philip, who thought there was something wrong with the ears of the horse, and Barry was quite tickled by this turn of events. And I had said to him uh, later on that day, um, how wonderful it would be if we could borrow the cricketer, which was very large uh, cricketing hair, um, 18 feet tall, which had been uh, exhibited at the Royal Academy Summer Show uh, that year. Wouldn't it be nice if that was standing on the boundary of a cricket pitch and could we borrow that? And so he smiled in his bleak way and said nothing. The following week, uh, I had uh, uh, a telephone call from Leslie Waddington, uh, who was his dealer, saying that Barry had decided to give uh, wow. that work to the college. Uh, and we've had another very fine gift from Alison Wilding. Richard Long, for our quincentenary exhibition, uh, did uh, one of his mud works, River Ave and Mud Hand Circles, in the upper hall. And rather to my astonishment, uh, the fellows all agreed that they would like to keep this work if it was possible, because we've always had a warm support among some of the fellows, but not among the totality of the fellows. <laughs> anyway, that was the view, and Richard Long was very happy that it should be kept. So we have a Richard Long work in the Upper Hall, and quite a few other interesting works. So that over the years, um, the college has established a nice link with uh, a number of uh, sculptors. We're having, we hope, quite a big exhibition uh, next summer for the 800th anniversary of the university. Uh, we hope Anselm Kiefer may be one of the... Uh, uh, the lenders and uh, Anthony Caro, uh, another, uh, so that uh, that continues mm -hmm. and somehow the college has got a reputation uh, in the art world now. At the moment, we've got wonderful work of three dinosaurs um, which are led by the Chapman brothers, great uh, <laughs> uh, iron things, uh, uh, Jake and Dinos Chapman, uh, and uh, so. Uh, that's something that's developed a dynamic of its own, I think. Uh, uh, Rod Mangum, who's the curator of works of art, is uh, very interested and well-connected. So I hope that's something that may continue and uh, survive, and no bad thing to have some interest in the visual arts in Cambridge. Lovely. Well, it fits with a recent interview I did with Anne Lonsdale, who talked a yes. lot about the women's paintings That's right, it's been a great mm. enterprise, too. Yeah. That's right, yes. Yeah. Well, it's a nice, positive, cheerful note to I end on. I think a positive note. Good. Thank you very much.